Anyway, this is Joe Alvarez. He runs High Ridge Hydroponics. And um, he can tell you a little bit about him and himself and what he does, why he does it. Um, so take it away, Joe. Thank you, Ellen, for giving me the opportunity to speak to everybody tonight. And thanks to everybody for joining on here. Uh, I'll tell you guys a little bit of background about myself, a little bit of introduction to what I do, how I do it, and why I do it. Um, and then I'll do a little demonstration here. I've got some seeding materials. I've got some bulk seeds here. I've got some cocoa core um, and some trays, and that's pretty much all you need. I've also got some grow lights here as well uh, that we'll get into a little bit later. LED, and this is... Uh, different type of light here. This is um, more of like a, a nursery racking kind of plant system that I'll show you guys talk a little bit more at the end. But um, feel free to follow along if you have the materials. Um, if not, you can take notes. I'll, I'll also send Ellen a little summary of, sorry, someone's calling me here. Um, I'm going to send Ellen a little summary of what what I'm saying in the whole class here. Someone just calling me on the other line. Um, I'm gonna send Ellen a summary of the notes of the class. And if you don't have the materials now, but you wanna do it at a later time, feel free. Uh, if you wanna ask me any questions that I, I uh, don't get to, we'll do a little question and answer at the end of the uh, session here. Um, so let's get started. My name is Joe Alvarez. I'm the founder and farmer at High Ridge Hydroponics in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Uh, I've been going to the BFA meetings for about two years now on and off. I first started going. Um, I heard about it through a friend and went over to the meetings pre-COVID at the Westchester Land Trust and it was really interesting to me. I uh, started out as a backyard gardener farmer with a small little uh, organic garden plot in the backyard growing veggies, uh, mostly for salad and, you know, the easy ones to start off. Um, so I've been doing that for a while and uh, I studied environmental science at Fordham University. So I, I've always kind of been an outdoor science -y kind of kid. Um, I went to college and studied environmental science. And after that, um, I have had a few different jobs. Uh, I worked as an organic gardener for a private gardening company in Reading, Connecticut, um, where we did outdoor gardening. Was, that uh, company was called Homefront Farmers. So I got a, a good uh, base knowledge there of just, you know, plants, transplanting, seeding, um, nice little introduction, more of a kind of professional introduction to agriculture and gardening and farming. And uh, so I graduated from college in 2017, and then in 2018, I started doing some gardening. And then um, in May of 2018, I moved out to Nevada, out by Lake Tahoe, and I worked at an aquaponics farm. Aquaponics is a form of hydroponics. It's a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. So aquaculture is fish farming, and hydroponics is growing plants in water rather than soil. So the way aquaponics works is that you grow fish in these large 3,000 gallon tanks and you take the, the wastewater of the fish and probably as most of you know that fish fertilizer is usually fish waste or fish emulsion is a really good organic fertilizer for plants. So this is a symbiotic relationship um, between plants and fish. So you use the, the wastewater from the fish to fertilize the plant. The plants uptake the nutrients in the, in the waste and they filter out the water and they send the clean water back to the fish. So I worked at that farm, it was about a 30,000 square foot indoor greenhouse that used climate control technology and LED lights um, to grow plants in the high Nevada desert. Um, it, uh, hydroponics in general is super efficient on water. It's about 85 to 90% more efficient on water because it's a closed loop system. Um, in soil farming, usually, um, you either water with a sprinkler, a hose, drip irrigation, and that water uh, runs off into the ground. Um, not all of it is used by the plant. So hydroponics is a little bit more efficient, or a lot more efficient, 85 to 90% more efficient on water usage because the water is in a closed loop system and it recirculates back for the plant. 
So I got a great foundation of uh, an introduction to this new kind of method of agriculture, hydroponics, um, which aquaponics is a subset of. And I worked at, at that farm for about six months. Uh, I lived on the farm. I was an intern there. So I lived in the farmhouse and worked on the farm every day. Um, I did a production and maintenance and facilities. So I got pretty well versed in a full kind of a full spectrum education. Uh, everything from planting to transplanting, harvesting, going to farmer's markets, um, maintenance, fixing pumps and machines and cleaning up fish poop, everything. So it was a, a pretty well-rounded experience for me. I, it was an internship. I lived there for about six months and I learned a lot. I learned a lot um, for basically the whole life cycle of vegetables from, from seed to sale. Um, and then also I got a pretty good um, education about eating healthy and eating food that you grow. So I got a greater appreciation for um, growing your own food. So that was a really mind uh, eye-opening experience for me as well. So I worked there for six months, but I was really kind of turned on to microgreens there um, because it was our best selling product at the market. I was the head microgreens grower at Dayton Valley Aquaponics for about six months. And um, we grew hundreds of trays each week. So this is the size of the tray that we grow. It's 10 inches by 20 inches. This is a, a standard size tray. Um, I have some other smaller size trays. Um, this here is a 10 by 10, which is a half. And these are five by five. The, the numbers is the, it's the dimension of the inches. So we were doing about 100 full-size trays a week. Um, depending on the variety of microgreen, um, you could harvest anywhere from half a pound to over a pound of, of vegetables um, in just one tray. Um, these trays will usually take, typically, depending on the climate, uh, about 10 to 14 days from when we plant it, which I'm going to do now, to when you harvest it and you have a, um, a ready-to-eat product which I have some over here. I just don't know where I put it. Oh, here we go. So this is the end product. These are microgreens. These are the radish microgreens and they start out looking like this, a seed, and they end up looking. Wow. So these are great. Uh, I eat them in salads, sandwiches. You could basically eat them anywhere you would uh, eat lettuce. I use them as a lettuce replacement. Um, the thing about microgreens is that they're super concentrated in flavor and nutrition. So these are the, the seeds that I have here today are daikon radish microgreens. Oh. So uh, daikon radish is a, actually a white radish. Most people are used to growing like red radish, watermelon radish, breakfast radish. They come in all different sizes. But if you were to plant this seed and, and grow it just like a regular radish rather than a micro radish, um, it would be a very long white radish, a daikon radish. Uh, the flavor is a little bit more spread out, but in microgreens, it's super concentrated. So it's got a bite. Like if you just have one little, uh, one plant, one stem, you're going to taste that, that spiciness, that flavor. So if you have a whole salad of it, it can be a little bit overpowering. The radish are on the spicier spectrum of the microgreens, but there's other uh, microgreens that you could grow. Um, that are a little bit more mild. Broccoli and kale are some are some favorites. Um, sunflower, sunflower shoots, pea shoots, arugula, red cabbage. There's you can grow microgreen anything. Uh, microgreen is just a term for the phase of growth that is the first leaf that emerges from the seed. So some people might know it as a cotyledon uh, stage of growth. Um, I don't use any fertilizer. Uh, I use all organic non-GMO seeds. Um, I buy my seeds from True Leaf Market or Johnny's online. Um, you can just buy them online, uh, depending on where you go. I think if you if you at True Leaf Market, they have free shipping over forty-five dollars, and Johnny's is free shipping over two hundred dollars. So you kind of have to put in a very large order to get the free shipping. But if you're just ordering a small one or two pounds, um, it shouldn't be too expensive. Um, so fertilizer uh, for my seeds, I just water them. Uh, to, in order to get them to the cotyledon stage of growth, they don't actually require any fertilizer. I'm, I'm growing them to the cotyledon stage of growth and then I'm harvesting them. If I were to 
grow them past the cotyledon stage of growth, then they would require additional uh, supplements of nutrition. Normally, they get that from the soil. However, I use cocoa core. Cocoa core is an inert growing medium. It's actually the, a byproduct of a coconut husk. Um, it's very absorbent. It just looks, it kind of looks like dirt, but it's the husk of a coconut that they grind up and they actually will pack it in, in, in a brick. Um, so I take that brick and I, and I put water on it. I, I rehydrate the, the cocoa core that's dried out. Um, once you rehydrate it and break it all apart, it turns into this very uh, fine kind of dust-like, soil-like um, substance. It's, in hydroponics, it's called a growing medium. Soil is a type of a growing medium, um, but not a hydroponic type of growing medium. Um, in hydroponics, some people use what's called rock wool, uh, which is like a, almost like a sponge-like uh, growing medium. Rock wool can be used as insulation as well. There's certain horticultural rock wool that you're supposed to buy. I wouldn't just start ripping down your walls and taking the rock wool insulation out of your walls, but it might work. Um, but yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of different... Some people use sand, some people use uh, gravel culture. Um, there's little clay pebbles that you can buy. So there's all different types of growing mediums. Um, I've found that cocoa core works best for me. It's very absorbent. It's very fine. It, it flattens out very well. Um, and it just, so the purpose of the cocoa core, because it doesn't add any nutrients like soil does, um, is for two purposes. One, to absorb and hold water. Uh, you want to hold water in the root zone uh, to make sure your roots don't dry out. The root zone is one of the most important parts of the microgreen growing process. Uh, that's how they drink up the water and that's how they hold themselves in. We're going to plant them super densely, so you want a good foundation in the roots. Um, the other reason... Um, yeah, so you got, you got structure and absorbency are the two reasons. Uh, that I like to use this as a growing medium. So I'll actually just start to do a little planting uh, right now as we speak. I've already, I know because I plant a lot of different, I plant so many different trays a week. I have this picture here with a little line on it. I don't know if you can see it. I have a line that I know exactly how much to put in here. Um, actually, before I start, I'm gonna just explain the trays that I'm using. So microgreens are very fragile. Um, you don't want to overwater them. You don't want to underwater them. You want to make sure that you give them the right amount of water. You're, remember, you're only growing them for 10 days. So if you screw up the amount of water for two days, you give it either too much or too little. Now that's 20% of the entire life cycle of that plant. So if you didn't have the right conditions for 20% of your life, you'd probably be a little bit screwed up too. So you want, you want to um, give it the perfect kind of climate, um, the, the right amount of water. You want to give it everything it needs. Um, you want to set it up because the plant's going to do most of the work. So I have two trays here um, for the ideal watering. The white tray on the bottom does not have holes in it. These trays, this is the white tray is what I'm going to call the reservoir tray. That's how I water it. These smaller trays, this is a five by five, has some holes in the bottom so that when I go to water it, this one has holes in the bottom too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour water in the white tray and then through capillary action and a wicking effect, and because the cocoa core is very absorbent, the water will be absorbed through the holes in the bottom of the tray and into the root zone. So that's the ideal way to water. If you were to come in with a sprayer or a, or a hose nozzle and, and, and hit it from the top, you would knock it all over because they're very fragile. So I like to bottom water. Um, some, some varieties are a little bit more um, heavy duty and have sturdier stems like sunflower or peas. But for the most part, um, bottom watering is the way to go. So you start out with two, two trays uh, or you, they don't even have to be trays. If you're just doing it at home, you can kind of find what you have around. Um, sometimes like a Chinese food takeout container, like those shallow ones uh, can, can work great. Um, they're usually about half the size of this. Um, 
it kind of just depends on what you have laying around. So if you have, um, you could use a, a, bottle, a water bottle that you cut in half, you can get creative with it, but you always do want to poke some holes in the bottom just so that they could absorb the water and drink, drink through those holes. So these trays are microgreen growing trays. So they already have the holes in the bottom. So what I'm going to do is, is just pour the cocoa core into my trays. I like to fill them up. See, these ones are actually a little bit taller. This, these smaller trays are probably two inches tall and this one is probably one inch tall. Um, I like to fill it up to the top of the tray. Um, it makes it a little bit easier to harvest uh, when it's full to the top. It also makes it um, just easier to plant if, it, if it's full of, full of cocoa core. So I like to just, and it's gonna get a little bit messy here most likely, but that's okay. It cleans up pretty easily. You actually don't even get any cocoa core like stuck to your fingers. It comes off your fingers. It doesn't stain your clothes or um, like soil might. But what I like to do is just spread it out nice and evenly. I'm going to fill it up all the way to the top. Kind of looks like a sheet of uh, brownies here. So you want to just make sure there's no clumps. Sometimes little you can get little clumps that might um, affect it down the road. So what you're going to do that looks good. Um, I actually have what I like to call a tamper. So this is for a full size 1020 tray. It's a little, it's like a press because you want to press down and make sure that your growing medium surface is flat. So the way you can do it though, if, if you have two of the same size containers, like for this one here, I have this one, but what I'm going to do is just put it right on top and I'm going to press down because it's the same size and it fits in. So you're going to press it down and you're going to get a nice flat surface there, right? So I'm just going to press this down on the 10 by 10 tray here a little bit. Just try to get it as flat as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect. It, it'll just help the, to get more even germination if it's um, as flat as possible here. So you can even just put it, press it down with your hands, make sure there's no clumps. If you're doing this with soil, it's the same process as well. So the amount of seed that you use, um, I get a little bit scientific and I'll actually measure it out to, where, uh, to an exact gram amount. I don't have a scale in front of me today and I assume maybe some of you do have a small kitchen scale so you can do it. Um, but if you don't have the same exact size containers, it might be hard to determine exactly how much seed to use. For a full size tray, if you do have the trays, I like to use 55 grams of radish seed. Um, the radish seed is, is a little bit on the larger side of the, of the microgreen seeds. If you've seen radish seed before, you know what it looks like. It's kind of hard to tell um, over the camera, but the seed density, I'll talk about seed density for a little bit. The, seed, the size of the seed and the density of the seed is gonna vary from uh, variety to variety. So radish seed, I use about 55 grams per tray but arugula seed is a lot smaller. So I only use about 18 grams of seed per tray. So if I use the same amount, it would be way overgrown, it'd be too thick. You would get mold, um, it would get damping off and, and the tray would kind of die off very quickly. So the best way to do it, um, if you're just starting out is trial and error. So you're probably going to screw up a few trays, it's inevitable. It's like the first time you planted, um, you know, arugula or lettuce or something in your garden, you know, the first time doesn't always go as planned. Um, but what I like to do, and the best way to do it, in my opinion, is to just start off slowly. So I'm not, I'm not going to measure this out. I'm just going to eyeball it. You want to just start off very slowly and just kind of sprinkle it on. Sprinkle, sprinkle the seeds onto the tray. Now I'm going to change the camera angle here in a second so you can see it a little better. Um, but basically just sprinkle it onto the tray like you're salting a steak is what I, is how I like to say it. Um, just very lightly. You can always add more. You don't, you want to make it nice and spread out. You don't want clumps. You don't want, um, seeds all over top of one another. You want a nice and evenly spread out. So let's 
see if I can angle here. Good. It's actually looking a little shy. So I'm just going to, where I think it's a little shy, like over here, you want to make sure it gets around the edges. Um, have a scale, you'll know when enough is enough and you can measure it out. So this is a half tray here. The white tray on the bottom is a full tray. So I use 55 grams for a full tray, but you would cut that feed density in half. So you use about uh, 27 or 28 grams for a half tray. So that looks pretty good. Um, it looks evenly spread out. I might have a little bit of clumpiness here and a little bit of emptiness here. So if it, you do see clumps, you can kind of spread them out with your finger. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So that's how you would seed a tray of microgreens. Um, I'm not gonna seed these smaller ones here, but I am gonna talk about cocoa core in general. So if you do buy cocoa core, sometimes it'll come pre-mixed and it'll come in a bag, like you'll buy a bag of mulch. Sometimes it'll come in a brick and you will need to add water to it to get it to this clumpy, to this uh, kind of texture and moisture content. Add too much moisture. It, it's clumping up nicely in my hand, which is good, but it's not falling apart. When I squeeze it, water is barely dripping out when I squeeze it hard. Um, you don't want water to become uh, sopping out like you're wringing out a towel, that means you have too much moisture in there. You do need moisture in the seeds though, uh, sorry, in the cocoa core, because that is how the seeds germinate. When you have seeds in a storage uh, container or a packet, they don't germinate because there isn't water. Water will activate your seeds. And I am not gonna water this in the traditional sense, because there's water in here when I rehydrate it. So the cocoa core contains enough water in, um, in the growing medium to sustain and water it through the, germination, um, through the germination process. So now, once you've planted your seeds, um, basically what you need to do is take another tray of the same size and put it right on top. You want to press it in. I'm sorry, angle isn't perfect here. Take your, your second tray on top, you press it down, and then you could use uh, some sort of weight. Um, some people will use a brick, some people will use a bag of flour. You don't want to, um, you want to have enough weight that actually gives resistance to the seeds. Now, it's not like you're drowning them in weight, but you want to have them have something to push up against. This is kind of simulating that they're underground, like the seed is underground, because we don't put any soil on top of the seeds. It's called the dry seeding. Um, so the seeds are at the surface of the growing medium. If you plant a seed outside, you would normally stick your finger in the hole put your seed in the hole and then cover it back up and water it, right? This is different because we're, we're doing this all inside. So you can kind of control um, the environment that your seeds are in. So we're going to kind of replicate, so to speak, um, putting soil on top of the seed out in the garden. So that means you're gonna put another tray on top of it and you're gonna put some weight on it. So this, I know this is about four pounds of seed. This would be this would be good. So if you had, uh, maybe it depends on, if you're doing a small tray, you need less weight. If you're doing a half tray, you need half the weight. If you're doing a full tray, you need uh, a lot of weight. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> so I think what I actually use for my full size tray is um, a paver from Lowe's or Home Depot. It weighs about 15 pounds for a full size tray. Sometimes I'd use bricks, I'd use bags of rocks, you could use a, a can of beans, whatever you have laying around the house should be fine. So you're gonna wanna actually put that on top of the secondary tray. You're not gonna wanna put it directly on top of your seeded tray. You're gonna wanna have the second tray right on top and then your weight in here. 
you're going to do that um, and kind of forget about it for the next couple of days. The seeds will start to sprout. Um, when a seed sprouts, it first sends out the radical. The radical is the root, uh, the tip of the root. It's going to send the seed, the root, down into the soil, and it's going to try to uh, set its set its roots in the soil. Then it's going to start to send out the stem. So once the once the root is set out, um, it'll start to grow the stem. And once it starts to grow the stem, it's actually going to start to push the second tray up. And you're going to say, I have like five or 10 pounds of weight on this. And you're telling me that the little seeds are going to start pushing it up. Yes, because you probably have a thousand to 2000 seeds in this little, this little 10 by 10 space here. So the power of all these seeds collectively is going to start to push up uh, the tray above it, the weighted tray. This, they are in search of light. They think that they're underground. If you think like a seed, the first thing that they're doing is looking for light to photosynthesize to then um, produce sugar and food for the cells in the plant. Um, so they'll start to push up. I would say that happens at about day four, day three or four. So if you come uh, every day, you can come and just peek under there and get a look. You don't want to disturb it. You don't want to take the weight off the weighted tray off and leave it off because then you're exposing the surface of the microgreens tray to the environment and then water will evaporate and you want to keep the water in there. That's another uh, benefit of this weighted tray is keeping, it's retaining the moisture level in there to create that little micro environment that allows the seeds to germinate. So after about three or four days, what you're going to see if you take this off at about day four, you're gonna see all these yellow little stems that are bent over and curled over. That's what you wanna see. Uh, you might see uh, root hairs, which is basically just, they're kind of like, uh, they look like little hairs on the stem of the root. Sometimes it, uh, people might think that it's mold, but there's a difference. It could be mold if you overwatered it also, um, it's, it's hard for a beginner to tell if you Google um, root hair versus mold and microgreens, or if you YouTube it, you might be able to um, tell the difference. But um, I'll, I'll try to include something on that in the notes. But basically, after, after four days, your seeds are going to be sprouted. They're going to have sent the root down, and they're going to have sent the stem up. Now, because they're not exposed to the light, because the weighted tray is on there and no light has penetrated in, um, they're going to be yellow. They're not going to be green yet. They, the, the plants only turn green when they produce chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a product of photosynthesis. And in order to photosynthesize, the plants need light to photosynthesize. So if they're void of light, they won't turn green. They'll turn yellow or they will be yellow. They're naturally yellow, but they turn green once they once they are exposed to the light. So after about four days, you're going to take this off and you're going to see yellow growth of baby stems, the, the, the flowers of the cotyledon are gonna be closed up. And then once they're, uh, once they're uncovered, you can put them underneath a light. Um, I like to use an LED grow light. The one that I have here is on Amazon. It's a four foot uh, LED light that just plugs right into your wall. I have it plugged into an extension cord here. Um, it has a little switch. You can turn it on and off. I like to plug this into a timer, just a, a regular wall timer um, that you could program with the dial. It's super easy. What I, what I like to recommend is 16 hours of light on and eight hours off. Um, that's for the optimal growing schedule. You can put this in your window and it'll grow just fine. It just might not grow as quickly as if you have uh, the LED light directly above it on a timer for the perfect amount of time each day. So this, because it's an LED light, it's very cool. It's very cool to touch. So I can actually put this only inches above my plant. However, the plant is gonna grow. So it's gonna start off at half an inch, then it's gonna get to an inch, then an inch and a half. So you don't want your light too, too close, especially if you're using, um, 
like a fluorescent bulb that's going to kick off heat or a metal halogen bulb. Um, the LED lights are the easiest. They're, they, they make them really cheap. This is like an $8 light on Amazon if you want to buy it. Um, I think they come in a pack of six, but they also, they're a great just general utility light if you want to use them in your, um, your garage or you have a workshop or something where you need some long four foot LED lights. Um, these lights, typically people think that grow lights, LED lights are super expensive. And that's because they are. However, the lighting requirements for microgreens are very minimal. Um, remember that we're only growing it to that cotyledon stage of growth. So that's essentially what a seed is programmed to do. A seed basically has the genetic, the instincts, whatever makes a seed a seed, it knows that it first sends down that root, it, 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 it germs in search for light. When it finds light, it sends out its first two cotyledon leaves, and then these lights but these leaves will then photosynthesize and grow the first true leaf and then on and on from there. However, we're not going to let it get to the first true leaf uh, phase of growth. We're going to harvest it right at um, the cotyledon stage. Now, I can show you here um, one that I've harvested so you can see kind of what I'm talking about. This one has... Even leaves, and you can see in that little V is the first true leaf that is starting to emerge. So I might have grown this one just a day too long because that little that little um, first true leaf that's starting to emerge only comes out in the in the last little bit of uh, the growth. If you were to if I were to harvest this maybe a day or two earlier, that first true leaf that's coming out there would not be there. So it's, it, it's fine to harvest it there. Um, it, it's more a matter of preference. Um, my definition of microgreens to harvest it before the first true leaf, it really depends on who you ask and, and what you're going for. Um, I will grow these for chefs at restaurants and some chefs like it with the first true leaf. Um, as it gets a little bit bigger, the flavor kind of dissipates. Uh, they're more concentrated in the earlier earlier stages of growth. Um, okay, so back to, back to the growing. You plant your seeds, right? You cover them up, you put the weighted tray on top, you leave it for about four days. You want to, it doesn't need any light while it's in the stacked phase, while you have the, the weighted tray stacked on top of it. Um, Excuse ideally, me, Joe. Hey, for, Joe, Lynn, Lynn Bernstein wants to know if it's okay to eat the roots. I have never eaten the roots. Uh, I've had people ask me about that before. Um, typically what I do is when I harvest it, I, so that's actually what the difference is between sprouts and microgreens. Typically you use the same seed. Um, however, a sprout, you can sprout in a jar. Um, it doesn't need any light to grow and you eat the root the seed and the stem and the leaf or however long you sprout them for, it will determine how, how big it is. So with a sprout, you eat the entire thing. With a microgreen, it's more of a cut green where you eat the stem and the leaf. Um, I don't eat the roots. Um, I'm sure that they're fine to eat. The only thing though, is that you have to kind of rinse them off because they're stuck in the soil or the cocoa core. So they have, it's kind of very tangled together. Um, I, I cut them with a scissor. Uh, I have like some, some pruning scissors here that I like to use. Kitchen scissors, you could use a sharp chef's knife to cut it. So basically they're growing in the tray and I just come along and I, I cut it with a knife or a scissor. And now I have this screen that's cut. Um, I actually don't wash microgreens, my microgreens, because I don't grow them in soil. I know that my uh, all my equipment is sanitized. I use all organic seeds. I don't use any fertilizer. I just use water and high quality seeds. Um, if you wash them, you're probably going to decrease the shelf life significantly if you don't dry them properly. Um, the best I would, and if you're doing it the way that I'm 
telling you right now, it's very um, extremely low risk. You're not going to really run into any um, issues with contamination or foodborne pathogens or illnesses, especially if you're using cocoa core. Sometimes if you use a composting soil, there can be bacteria or um, some sort of life in your soil. Um, so that's just one thing to, to think about. Uh, but if you're using cocoa core, I use an OMRI listed cocoa core. Um, it's a sterile growing media. So that means that it's not alive. It doesn't have any bacteria or, you know, good. And when I say bacteria, I mean good bacteria, um, things that will be beneficial in your soil. Um, but sometimes uh, it could be detrimental to um, the quality of your product. So let's, let's go back into the grow. I'm kind of going off on a tangent a little bit, but um, you do four days in the stack phase. You take, you take the tray off, you're going to now it's put them under the light. After four days, you don't water them at all because there should be enough water in your cocoa core or your growing medium or your soil when you put it in there. Remember how I said you want the right consistency? You want it to clump a little bit in your hands. That means that there's enough, there's enough moisture in there. Um, so there's enough moisture in there to get it through the stacking phase. So when you unstack it, you're going to have these yellow kind of uh, stems that are that have sprouted and grown. Now it's ready to go under the light. Um, you can set up a, a, a rack where you can mount your LED light above it. Um, if you have this light, um, I typically like to leave it about eight inches above the surface. Um, the greens will grow uh, depending on how long you let them grow. Um, they'll go one, two, three inches, um, depending on how long you leave them. Um, but longer, I think that they, they're a little bit tastier. Um, they you get more yield, um, if you keep them void of light. So one thing that you could do after, before you introduce them to the light, this is, you don't need to do it. If this is a, a little bit more advanced step, but it's, it's pretty simple at, at the same time. Basically all you do is you just, once you unstack them, you can put a, uh, an, an, another tray reverse on top. I call this like a blackout phase. So basically they're unstacked. They don't have the weight on them anymore, but now you're purposely uh, keeping them void of light. This is gonna cause them to stretch. Um, this is why these stems are so long. If you uh, have ever started seeds, which I assume some of you have if you're in this meeting, uh, if you've ever started seeds before, um, at seeds that are too leggy. Uh, it means that the stems that grow too long. This is essentially what we're doing on purpose with our microgreens. It's we're keeping uh, the light further away to extend the stem on purpose. Now, because they're planted so densely, they're not gonna fall over. They're actually gonna support each other and keep each other up. They're gonna, it's gonna be planted, like, it's going to look like a carpet of uh, microgreens. They're going to be very densely planted together. Um, I'll include a picture in the notes uh, that I send Ellen that she could blast out to everybody what a finished product tray of microgreens should look like. Um, so you do that for about one day with the, with the blackout phase, with, the, with keeping them void of light. You can put them in a dark room if you have a closet um that you don't turn on the lights uh you just don't want to forget about them for too long but um once you unstack them and before you put them in the light you want to give them a good watering so basically all you do for watering is remember how we started with the white tray on the bottom the white tray on the bottom is your reservoir tray that all your seeded trays go into now this tray with the seeds in it does have holes in the bottom right so you fill up your pitcher with water or you take it to your sink or a hose and you just fill the bottom of the reservoir tray, the white tray with no holes in it, with water. Um, there's a little bit of an art to determining exactly how much water is the right amount of water. Certain varieties are more, um, figure out exactly how much water it needs. That I'd say the amount of water um, 
for each different variety of microgreen could be one of the more difficult things to know exactly, exactly what it is. You're probably going to get close enough where it's going to be fine. But sometimes what you'll see is if you overwater it, you could get a little bit of mold growing on your tray. Um, ideally, you don't want to eat products that have mold growing on it. Uh, what you could do if you do get mold growing on it is just kind of do what I call a spot treatment. Um, is basically just picking out that clump of the tray and trying to remove it uh, from the tray to prevent the spread of mold on your tray. Um, do that as soon as you see it, even if it's just one little seed that is starting to have mold grow on it, just pick it out and throw it away. Um, so that's, that's for watering. You, you want to get the right amount. Basically, when you look at your tray, um, you can pick it up. You can, feel, you can feel how heavy it is. If it feels light, that probably means that there's not enough water being retained in the cocoa core. If you look at it and you see the color of the cocoa core is a lighter brown, that means that there's probably not, not enough water. Um, so you want to add some water. Basically, you want to water it every day, um, just a little bit. You don't want the roots to dry out. You always want the roots to stay moist. Um, hey, it, it depends on the size of your reservoir tray, but if you if you fill up the bottom of your entire reservoir tray, about half a centimeter, that'll give enough water uh, to the tray to drink for that day. If you come back uh, the next day and there's still water in your reservoir tray, your tray with no holes in it, that means that you probably overwatered it. Um, so the next day, um, well, you want the, all the water to be gone. You want the tray to drink up all the water through the capillary action, through the wicking effect. So when you come back the next day, there should be no water left in the bottom of the tray. It should all be retained in the cocoa core in the root zone. Um, so you're going to stack it for four days with the weight on it. You're going to unstack it. You're going to put it into the reservoir tray and you're going to water it. Now you water it once a day. I, I try to do it right in the morning. If your um, timer for your light is scheduled to come on at 8 a.m., I like to do it at 8 a.m. just to keep it consistent. Um, you don't have to do it at, at that time. You just try to try to keep it consistent uh, once a day. Every 24 hours is, is pretty much ideal. Um, and you'll see that the, the radish does drink a lot of water. There are some other varieties that are a little bit lighter drinkers of water. Um, I'd say radish is on the medium to heavy of the drinking side. Um, so you'll water it the first day and you'll water it every day thereafter from the bottom by filling the tray, the reservoir tray underneath and the tray with the holes will absorb through the holes and drink. Stack for four days, you could do, sorry, I'm getting a call here. Uh, you can stack it for four days and then you put the, the blackout tray on top of it for a day. So now you're at day five. And now if you have the light, you can turn on the light and put it underneath about eight inches away. And that's pretty much it. You just leave it under the light. Uh, the, the light's going to stay on for 16 hours and turn off for eight hours. That eight hours of darkness is important for the photo period. You want the plant to rest. Um, if it's working all day for 16 hours to photosynthesize to make more cells and create food for the plant, um, it's going to be tired. It wants some time to, to relax, essentially. So 16 hours on, eight hours off is perfect. That's perfect. That's the ideal scenario. If you're growing them in the winter. Obviously, I'm in Connecticut. You guys are in New York or probably in the region. You know that there's less than 16 hours of sunlight a day. So it's okay. Your plants just aren't going to grow as quickly. So this for me is about ready in nine days, nine or 10 days is usually when I'll harvest it, depending on when I have the order. So after four days of germinating and one day with the blackout, lid or upside down tray on top of it now you're at five days for four more days of being in the light you'll get a full harvest and that you're going to have something that looks like this um 
harvest on a full size tray about 12, 12 to 14 ounces of microgreens for one tray. Now, if you just have the radish in a salad, it might be a little bit overpowering uh, because these are a spicy variety. Uh, there's other varieties like cabbage, um, kale, and broccoli that are a little bit more mild. We'll give you similar yields, but you want to might you might want to mix them in as well. Um, typically, I'd say about two to three ounces is a pretty good sized salad. If you're just having microgreens in a salad, if you take three ounces of microgreens and put them in a bowl, you're, you're going to have a pretty good base for a bowl because then you're going to add tomatoes, cucumbers, carrots, onions, avocado, whatever you like to put on a salad. But sometimes if I just have radish or a spicy variety of microgreens, you can mix it half and half with some other baby greens or mature greens. You mix 50% microgreens, 50% lettuce, or 50% microgreens, 50% arugula, 50% microgreens, 50% kale. Um, so there's a couple of different, different uh, ways you can make your salads. It kind of just depends on what you want to do, um, depends on how good your harvest is, um, what your yields are. But in about nine or 10 days, you'll, you'll have a full tray of microgreens uh, that are ready to go. Um, and all, all you have to do to harvest them is just get a, a nice, clean, sharp pair of scissors. They're going to be grown about this tall. You're just going to cut them a little bit above, maybe depending on how tall yours end up being. Uh, I like to cut them as close to the cocoa core as possible so I don't waste. Um, but just come through and you cut them off. I put them uh, in a, ba a Ziploc bag like this or a colander or a clamshell container. If you, you can put them in a mason jar. Um, something that... Um, you can seal. Uh, you don't want moisture to get in. If moisture starts to accumulate and condensation gets in, it'll actually decrease the shelf life. But, <coughs> excuse me, if you harvest your greens and you put them in a clamshell or a mason jar and you seal it, you'll get at least seven days of shelf life in your refrigerator. Um, it's on, on Monday. Um, but, uh, and I know that these will, um, will last at least a week and a half to two weeks. Uh, so uh, a question come in on the temperature range. I say, if the temperature of your room is comfortable for you, it's comfortable for your plants. The optimal temperature is going to vary a little bit depending on the variety that you're growing. Um, broccoli and arugula typically like a lower temperature than cilantro and basil. Um, cilantro and basil might like it above 75, but broccoli and arugula probably like it between 65 and 75. So depending on the temperature of your house, if you have what you keep it at, if it's the summer or the winter, if you have air conditioning, you don't have air conditioning, um, they'll grow fine. They just might grow faster or slower depending on the temperature of the room. Um, I would say a safe bet is with about degrees is probably the ideal uh, temperature to shoot for. Can you say that again? It, it, it went out for a second. The temperature? Ideally is around 70 degrees, give or take a few degrees. Okay. Um, but depending on where you're at, every room is going to be different. There's going to be little microclimates. If you're next to a window or if you're next to a heater or an air conditioner, it might be a little bit different. A couple um, other questions. I, One, what, do you clean the tray with anything special? And can you reuse the, the coconut coir? Use. Um, after I harvest it, what I do is I compost. Um, I wouldn't recommend reusing the cocoa core. Um, the main reason is that because once you cut your, your, now you cut a whole tray of stems, you're probably not gonna get every one perfectly off. Um, so there might be a few that are still dead on the, on the tray here. Um, so now you have dead organic matter uh, that's starting to decay. As soon as you cut it, it's starting to decay. It might not look like it, but now you have dead organic matter on there. 
you're going to want to sanitize your tray. Um, if you want, if you were to replant, you would have to come through. Um, not only is it dead on the surface, but the root system starts to die because you're not watering it anymore. Um, you've cut the stem, so they're not photosynthesizing with the stem and the leaves. Um, so I'd say cocoa core is pretty cheap. Soils, you know, depending on what you get. Um, for me, where I get it, it costs about 50 cents for a full tray, and you get about three quarters of a pound off that. So uh, I would say just reuse it um, because it is starting to die though, you do want to sanitize your tray after every use. Um, what I'll use is a hydrogen peroxide or a bleach solution, about 20%. Um, you know, the easiest way to do it is to just take, you obviously will just take your tray and knock it out. You just dump it all out. You try to, try to remove uh, all the physical debris. You might have some roots that are stuck to the bottom of the tray. Just try to knock it out, make sure you get as much out as you can. But then you just lean up against the wall. If you have a powerful hose, you can kind of just spray out whatever stubborn uh, root matter is stuck in there. Um, spray it out. So you rinse it first, and then I spray it with a, a cleaning solution, either hydrogen peroxide, a diluted hydrogen peroxide, or a diluted bleach solution. You spray that on here with a little spray bottle, and then you rinse that off, and then I flip it over and I do the other side too, just, just to be sure, because sometimes I'll stack them up. So you don't want the, the bad bacteria or pathogens that are on the bottom of this to contaminate it the next time you put it on, on this tray. Um, there was uh, reusing the soil and washing the trays. Someone else wants to know, um, uh, more about the fertilizing, repeat about the fertilizing, if you add nutrients at all? Don't add any nutrients. Um, the seeds are, or in my opinion, this is the way I like to explain it. The seed is kind of like a spaceship. It's biologically programmed to have enough nutrients stored in this little um, seed, this little spaceship to give it new life on another planet, right? So you're putting it into a whole nother planet, a whole nother growing environment. It's going to have enough nutrients in it to get it to this micro green stage. If it, if you were to grow it to maturity, you would need to supplement with other nutrition, other fertilizers. Typically you don't need that because it's, it's provided by the soil. But now remember I'm using coconut quartz, sterile growing medium, it doesn't have any nutrition, any nutrients in it at all. If you wanted to grow it to the first true leaf or past this stage, you, you could fertilizer. There are some fertilizers. I would suggest using a water soluble fertilizer. Um, I like to use organic. It depends on what you have laying around, um, but it really doesn't need it. I would say do it without it. You're going to get great yields. You're going to get Nice green growth, um, and it, it should be just fine without fertilizer. Um, also, uh, Sue Buetti wanted to know, for that bag of greens, uh, microgreens that you have there, how many trays did it take? How much seed? How much coconut core? About? I think that this is probably about three trays of micro, three full trays, three of the 10 by 20 trays. Um, so this light can grow four trays underneath it at once. I would say you probably want, because you just stack them like this, one, two, three, four, right? Obviously you put it eight inches apart, um, eight, sorry, eight inches underneath the light, but you can stack them four next to each other. This is a four foot wide light. The tray is 10 inches wide, so you'll have a little bit of space in between. Um, I like to use, I, I don't know the exact measurements. I call it like a scoop. So this is a, a one gallon um, pitcher. I think I, I measure it out to three, about three, three liters of soil once it's de, uh, rehydrated uh, per tray. Um, the seed density for radish microgreens 
for one full tray is about 55 grams. Um, if you're doing a half tray, it's half of 55. If you're doing a five by five tray, it's eight of an eighth of 55, whatever that comes out to. Um, I'm only getting the previews of the questions because I'm on my phone. Okay, Ellen, so you can read it. Yeah, it says you said this was a regular LED light, right? Uh, not needing a particular spectrum like a grow light that you would use for more mature plants. And also, second, another question: um, Do you soak the seeds first? So the LED light um, spectrum okay. and soaking seeds. So there. Grow lights can get very complicated. Um, any light should work um, to get something to grow. This light is actually, um, I think it says it on here. So it's 20 watts and it has 6500-6500K. Uh, I believe this stands for Kelvin. It's like the warmth of the light. Um, most grow lights are, are measured in wattage. So this is a very low wattage light. It means it doesn't put off um, a lot of light. If you were to get a light sensor and measure it, it would measure very low. But for only growing to the cotyledon stage of growth, it's more, it's more than sufficient to do it. If you see that your microgreens are stretching, if they're extending out and they're leaning to get more light, like um, say you have it like this, right? And your light is eight inches above it, above this, but it's in the middle. The greens that are growing at the end of the tray might lean in towards the light, but the ones that are directly underneath it are probably just gonna be going straight up. But these ones on the end and on this end might come and lean in. That means that you probably need two lights, right? So if you had one, now they're eight inches above, one here, and one here, one, two, that might be the best way to do it. That's actually what I do is I use two of these lights for each tray, above each tray, but you can do four wide, if that makes sense. I, it's sort of, uh, I, could, I could include some pictures um, in, the, in the email with, that I sent to Ellen. Um, and then soaking the seeds, um, there's certain seeds that you wanna soak and there's certain seeds that don't need to be soaked. Um, I like to soak peas. I like to soak wheat, wheatgrass, um, sunflower, um, cilantro, but there's, there's soaking can get a little bit complicated. I would say if you're a beginner, I would say start off with the easier seeds that you just dry seed. Um, these seeds, sorry, I gotta charge it for a second. My phone's dying on me here gonna plug it back in. But um, these seeds, the, the radish seeds, broccoli, arugula, kale, um, cabbage, you don't actually need to soak. You can do a dry, you can do a dry seeding process on these ones. It'll be just fine. And when I say dry seed, I mean just take the seeds out of your package and sprinkle them onto the cocoa core. The moisture in the cocoa core will be sufficient to activate those seeds and get them to start growing. I think that's about Anything it. Anything else coming in? Um, maybe one last question. It is eight o'clock. I want to respect uh, your time. Any other questions? I'm more than happy to answer any more questions that people may have here. Um, um, I'll, I'll include some contact information in my notes to you guys. So if you have any other questions for Joe, um, you know, if something comes up, we can, uh, I can con connect you with him. Um, okay, so uh, I think that that was great, Joe. Great detail, good explanations, really appreciate it. So um, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming. We had a great, great group tonight. So uh, happy holidays and uh, thanks again. Yeah, well, let me know how it goes. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me. Ellen will send out my email uh, information. If you wanna call me or text me, I'm more than happy to or FaceTime me, it could be like your virtual uh, microgreen doctor. If you have any questions <laughs> or something that's going wrong, uh, I'd be more than happy to give you some pointers and uh, get you 
get you to this point where you got the greens in the bag and then your salad. So okay, that's your new name, microgreen you. doctor Joe. Oh gosh. There you go. I got the stethoscope. Uh, all right, guys. Thanks so much Thank for coming. So much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you, Ellen. Be well. Thanks, Bye, Ellen. Guys. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hope you Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. I feel sleepy.